if you have the anxious attachments or avoidance is where it's like you're you will then go for these like dopamine hits and it's almost it's like lust in our brain is so much stronger than love where actually love if we look at love it would be very consistent it would be there for you you know but if you've not had that from caregivers your dopamine hits of somebody not being there and you know this rejection going around or these abandonment uh, wounds if somebody's doing that to you you know in the romantic relationship that's then going to give you these dopamine hits um which is where your trauma bonds is just you know that's the excitement really so it's then realizing you know it's it's almost like you've got to if you are in any of them attachment styles it's realizing that actually this is lust it's not lost Welcome back to Soul Awakenings with Madhya Sosan Podcast. Today we have Francesca. Francesca is a creative psychotherapist. Her experience includes working with adverse experiences and challenges. Her approach is empathetic, non-judgmental and person-centered. Francesca works with both adults and children from a variety of different backgrounds. Her practice draws in on neuroscience, changing neural pathways through the brain-body connection using embodiment. She specializes in attachment, anxiety, and trauma-informed care. Let's bring her on. Hi, Francesca. How are you doing? Yeah, good, good. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. Um, So, Oh my God. So where did we meet? Where did we meet first time? Do you remember? It's through Olivia, yeah. probably. Our friend yeah, Olivia. through Olivia. And I think it was at the fire ceremony, I think. Yes, our friend Natasha was holding fire ceremony. It was at her, Olivia's birthday. Oh, yes. Yes, we went to 20 oh, stories. Yes, yeah. yeah. And then we just connected, wiping off each other. And then we got talking about relationships and all sort of different things. And then I found out you're a therapist and... I was like, yeah, this woman needs to come on my podcast. <laughs> and here you are. <laughs> so to start off with, like, I know who you are. Our listeners don't know who you are. Tell us a bit about yourself, who you are, what do you do? A brief overview for our listeners. Uh, yes, so, um, um, yeah, so I'm currently a therapist. Uh, so I study drama, psychotherapist. Um so basically it's um you know it's working on the unconscious as well as the conscious basically um so a lot of the time you know the way that we process things can be you know through metaphor um through stories through art um so it's a way of processing things basically like non-verbally uh which then leads to you know direct expression um, so a lot of it is working with your unconscious mind, but then it always leads to um, direct, basically. Right. So you at the moment you go in schools and you what sort of things do you do? Uh, yes, yeah, so I work with uh, I work with children. Then I work privately as well. Um, I, yes, so I work both with adults and children, basically. Mm-hmm. Okay, so uh, so most of it is um so most of the um therapy is you know trauma centered, um it's yeah it's surrounding you know um yeah most of it is surrounding trauma basically um and or for instance if you come with anxiety a lot of the time that can be trauma related, mm-hmm. um so then it's working out you know where the anxiety actually comes from. Mm -hmm. um so yeah or even you know relationships a lot of the time people will come um with relationship problems but actually that's going back to early childhood and often that's again going back to trauma yeah I know we're going to talk about relationships that's our favorite topic (laughs) because that's all (laughs) we talk about (laughs) before we get into relationships let's talk about modeling because you were a model before right so tell me what was that experience like for you 
Uh, yeah, so it started, so yes, yeah, so I started modeling when I was 14. Um, so yes, yeah, so I was scouted from like a younger age. Um, and then obviously, like, you know, there's a lot of pressures to stay like a certain size. Um, you know, like the industry is very, you've got to be like this certain image. Um, you've got to fit like these industry expectations. Uh, so a lot of the agencies, obviously, you've got to fit their image for what you know the advertising campaigns um but a lot of the time the images you know look nothing like you mm. uh so you know everything's airbrushed everything's false um so then you've got like you know your portfolio but nothing is like a representation of you and what you are trying to, you know, adhere to on them uh, beauty standards is like very unrealistic before the editing begins, really. You know, you've got to be like a 24 inch waist, a 34 inch hips. And it's um, now this is going back to when I was 40. So, you know, we've came like a long way in the beauty industry now. Uh, but I think we're in like a whole different time. So I think now we're in this time where, you know, we've got like Instagram, we've got, um, you know, all these social media platforms where everybody's editing themselves now, aren't they? Mm-hmm. So then you just think, what impact is that having on the other girls who are watching it, who are like believe and it's real? And then I think it all comes back to a lot of like teenage girls aren't feeling good enough just as they are so I think a lot of it comes back to that yeah so it's 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 interesting isn't it because a lot of what we do is we follow the television we follow the media and with the modeling if it's there are very like um it's like it's it's well known that the that kind of that part of the world is a lot of there's a lot of suicide mental health issues behind the scenes but what's projected on the outside is completely different and the young kids are seeing that and thinking that they're this is it whereas then they go through the same uh, because you're filtering your life you're filtering everything you're not your authentic self and then they go through that like not good enough not pretty enough if I don't have this at the same time, all the models, probably the most famous models are going through it at the same time as well, but they're not showing it. Yeah, right? definitely. Yeah. Um, and I think that that's probably like a part of the problem. Um, and I suppose it goes into, you know, every other aspect of life as well. You know, it's like the Disney families, isn't it? Who, you know, showcase themselves as they've just been to Disney World. And it's a snapshot picture where actually behind the scenes is something completely different. But what you're showcasing is just that holiday you're not seeing anything behind that mm-hmm. um but I think it does really happen in you know the modeling industry is um massive for that really um just on the false levels really so did you experience anything like what did what was your experience of it was it quite harsh on your part or did you did your mental health kind of suffer while you were you were in that part of the world yeah definitely I'd say it's kind of like that thing of you know um it would be I remember being on like a catwalk when I was uh 14 and I'd actually fainted in the in the toilets in the backstage and they knew that I'd fainted um and then I was given a Mars bar and told to you know continue um wow the show yeah um and now I look back and I think oh my gosh like you know 14 you think you're so old don't you like do you know what I mean but in it I was so young um so yeah and then you know years later I was I think I was about 26 and it happened to another girl who was 14 who I was like behind the scenes with and it was only then that I was like oh my gosh like how damaging 
is this industry um you know and because I could I, I was a lot older and I was like you know I need to get out of this industry which is telling these young girls to like fit these sizes they don't you know there's no education around how to get to these sizes or anything like that other than you know like it's just you need to get to this size that's it um so it's all very um yeah so it's all very detrimental really how long were you in how long were you in modeling um so from 14 until I was 26 26 yeah okay so was it like properly full on and they is it seems like the part they they don't care they don't care if you're done you just need to put put up a show and just be it's like a bit like hunger games but not hunger games is like it's a game yeah literally and all they really care about is if this person fits their um image that's all they care about so they don't obviously care of how how they get there or anything like that and you know there is there's now a lot of things I think it was like Paris Fashion Week that put in you know that they're gonna have to have like a BMI over a certain thing and things like that um but at the same time you think you know that's that's not a measurement of health (laughs) of your BMI it's just ridiculous that that's Look yeah at the trauma look at the trauma that these young girls have are experiencing yeah not only that but like their caregivers as well like 14 year olds are still under a care of their parents right so their caregivers are knowingly pushing them for it yes definitely yeah um and i think you know I think that's where a massive problem comes into it really is you know if if you have got a 14 year old and as you say like caregivers and pushing uh them types of experiences or anything like that I mean that's just I mean again though it goes into that can go into anything can't it really if you know um caregivers pushing on the education and then you end up with a very anxious um child you know so there's so many ways in which I think um a lot of the time it it, it's it is coming from um caregivers of why um why things like that really yeah so there's like then there's the rise in the self-harm uh suicide um a lot of mental health issues which is which is what which worries me really really worries me because it's we've been taught to be something we're not right and we're it and we've been pushed pushed and pushed and it's like you know now like nowadays like you said the instagram world the um the the girls i'm seeing now they have like really young girls and they have like all fashionable like stuff and they look up to these these women but not realizing that these women aren't aren't any superheroes or they're not then they're just they're they're struggling as much as well yeah definitely um and I think that's probably like the biggest part of the problem is that as well really but if you know I think for me if somebody as you were saying you know if somebody has them caregivers who install that good enough um, then they might not end up going down them type of industries. Do you know what I mean? Mm. Or like they, there's a less likelihood of them than you know, uh, being on Instagram and wanting to wanting this external validation. Mm-hmm. Uh, because actually, they're installed within them is that they're good enough as they are. But if if that's not being installed within somebody, that's where this it's like you know your Maslow's hierarchy Mm -hmm. that then flips on its head basically so what 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 that you're then dealing with is somebody who's you know just on the self-esteem level and they're just in this need of like a lot of people say it's attention I always say like change the attention to connection because what actually is happening they're wanting you know connection 
but they're doing it in all these wrong ways to get the connection basically yeah and nobody's teaching them the internal world is everybody's teaching them the external world and how how are they supposed to get to that self-acceptance that self um self yeah self accept acceptance yeah that, you know they are okay as a as if they, they as they are like you yeah. know I know it's like I don't wear makeup at all whatsoever well I do <laughs> in this podcast I'm wearing it but I don't wear it on my everyday life right most yeah. of you see me as in as in as it is right and I come in but I have had now this is quite interesting because I was very much of a in a pop culture kind of before my awakening where you know when I was watching tv shows I had role models as like the the actors and actresses and uh, you know I was sucked into that world and at that point I was really overweight now you see me now it's like what are you talking about my dear but I was really overweight and every every time I would look at them I see this is how the world should be. That's how my mentality was. Mm -hmm. This is how the world should be. And every time I would stand in front of, I couldn't even stand in front of the mirror because I was so ashamed. I felt shame and I felt like um, I'm ugly. That's what I felt like. That I'm, Mm -hmm. I'm stood in front of the mirror and I feel ugly because I'm overweight. I need to be thin girl. And that that was my mindset. But obviously, that time, I didn't process any of my trauma, like, you know, a trauma of my dad dying and my mom and all of that stuff. I was like, you know, br- like, wasn't purging anything out. I wasn't looking at it. But at that point, like, with all that trauma, it's it adds to it. Because the world, you're looking for, like you said, external validation. But when the external validation isn't like showing you that the way you are is beautiful. Yeah. They're not showing you that, right? A thousand percent. That's it. Yeah. Um, So it's all, and then it's almost like it's all going back and forth between, you know, like, so it's consistently going like this, really. Yeah. Um, you know, and so then you go on something on a platform that then is making you not feel good enough. Mm-hmm. But then, you know, uh, you end up posting this selfie to get these likes, even though you've not felt good enough to begin with, yeah. for like this validation. Mm. Mm, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's crazy. Okay, so so you went from modeling to therapy. Yes. That's a yeah. big change. That's a massive yeah. change. Completely different world. <laughs> right? Why? Why? <laughs> well, we know why, but why? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. So, I just found myself. So, I actually went into, so at the time, because we are going back like years ago, um, I'd found myself, you know, going down like the influencer lifestyle a lot more. And, you know, the agencies are very, were very much at the time, you know, um, when you go to the castings and things like that, they were very much, you know, asking, um, you know, how many followers have you got? You know, obviously, like that was like a major part of the job then. Um, so yes, so I'd found myself, you know, and before you know it, you're just in this lifestyle. Mm. So it's not even like you're just in there. And I think it comes down to sometimes, you know, it's like who you surround yourself with, really. Um, so yeah, so I'd ended up going down this influencer lifestyle, basically, of, you know, trying to build followers, all of these type of things. Um, and I was just stood in a beat one day and I'd been like given loads of like bikinis to post um and it was actually so it was actually one of my ex-boyfriends who I was getting him to photograph again 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 I was not happy with one of the images Mm. and you know (laughs) I'd ended up saying to him like you know this like the image isn't good enough blah 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 like I wasn't happy again and again and um and I was like something like needs to change like you know how am I taking a million photographs on this day I'm not happy with one image but what 
<laughs> if my life has got me to a point <laughs> where this is what I'm doing. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? You start <laughs> questioning, it's like, right, I, I need to look at this. What yeah. is happening? And yeah. Then, <laughs> yeah, definitely. And, you know, I think it's that thing as well of like, there's obviously like there's no fulfillment in it so you know since I was very young I was like listening to you know your Tony Robbins and all of this um you know all of the, these coaches online um so yes yeah, so I was very much always into personal development um and I was just thinking I'm living like the most unfulfilled <laughs> life mm. really yeah yeah, yeah. Yeah, so you then you got trained in therapy. So what what was the process? Yeah, so I'd studied um so for my undergrad I'd studied um acting. Um so that was all part of my undergrad and then I went to do my masters in um drama therapy right. from okay. there. So the drama therapy how do you work with that? Now that's that's quite interesting. I've never like I don't think I've heard of drama therapy before I've heard of trauma so how does yeah. that work? how do you do therapy in drama <laughs> or drama <laughs> um yeah so it is literally so it's going back to um so because most of it is working with your unconscious um so say for instance if if you had experienced something, you might bring in, you know, metaphors that then relate to your experiences. Um, you know, or it could be that you do like a lot of um mask work. So it would be looking at, you know, um what what somebody portrays on the outside and then, you know, what goes on internally, like looking at our like shadow selves. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's yeah, that's massive with it. Uh, but it can be it's so um, you know, it's so like various of the approaches that you can use because it's so like client centered. So mm-hmm. say for instance, it just depends on who comes to you mm-hmm. of you know of the approach that you use really. So do you act, do you role play or something? Yes, sometimes, yeah. So you could, um, so with some clients, depending on if they wanted to, um, but you could like role play, uh, do like a lot of improvisation because in the improvisation, a lot of your, um, you know, a lot of things of what's actually going on will come out within the improvisation. Wow. Yeah, because it's on an unconscious level. Wow. Um, so yeah but you might it could be a direct so it could be a direct approach of the role play Mm -hmm. um you know so it could be that I could bring in a story that would relate Mm -hmm. and then you would do a role play around that or it could be you know that it's more of a um like more like an improvisation Mm. Um, and it's just coming from like that play aspect really right so it's like um you could purge a lot of your stuff like your emotions will come in because it's subconsciously your even though you're role playing but subconsciously is coming out um oh wow this is really really interesting and then obviously all of the reflection would be you know looking at what's actually happened there so what you've actually processed um and then it would be like you know do you think this means this do you think this could mean this um oh so a lot of self-reflection and do you feel that the clients that you work with they they have quite a lot of um how do you open how do you open up if some if one person is like oh I don't, I don't really want to I don't want it to come out it's like you know because we all have our walls up how do you work with that energy um yeah if it, so a lot of the clients you know um you know if it's somebody who's came privately you know it's very much that um they're almost willing themselves anyway Mm. um so and I think personally I think therapy can only work if you're willing it all comes from that person Mm -hmm. um so it's only what you're able to process yourself um really um so most 
yeah so most of my clients are in that space already really um I think obviously if you can have you know going back to the masks uh side of things you can get somebody who comes who's very masked Mm. um you know and then it would be looking at why and where that mask comes from and looking at you know all of that like social conditioning which leads up to that mask and then you know um working back towards our true self really oh wow that's that's amazing so how long were you are you be have you been doing this um for about seven years now seven years wow that's that's incredible because I've not heard it's like I always find it's like oh role playing I I get there is a part of me who feels Ooh, embarrassed by playing a role of some kind but I guess that's my defense mechanism is like maybe coming out it's like what let's just put like mask on then so nothing comes out yeah definitely yeah a hundred percent yeah so it is really then like I'm working with that really yeah and but equally it's that thing of you know, if somebody comes to me, it might be that we never do role play ever mm. in the sessions because it might be working on a whole, um, you know, on something completely different, really. Mm-hmm. Um, so it, it's so um, client-led, basically. Mm-hmm. So, you know, everything just comes from uh, the person of what they want to do, really. So what, what, what so, okay, so if you don't do role play, then what sort of things that that do you do um yes so it could be it could be like various things it could just be that you use art so art can be massive really you know it could be that you're exploring things through like paint uh through clay um you know a lot of it could just be um yeah a lot of like indirect uh ways but using it could even be music Mm -hmm. uh so you can bring anything you know a lot of the time it would be that um a client might want to really play music uh, but actually they're relating to that music Mm -hmm. you know so that will come out through and then we'll speak about why (laughs) they'd want you know why they'd want to play that music um Mm -hmm. so it could be any various forms really of creativity oh amazing that's amazing I gotta get a session with you this is great <laughs> <laughs> I could role play what you can help me with that why can't I open it's like you know when you're in drama school or something or yeah. in drama one of your lesson and your teacher's like you playing this role and you're like no, don't, 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 don't pick me yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's like it's like what part now you get into therapy it's like internal family sister what part is this is not wanting yeah. to play this role <laughs> you mess again yeah. Yeah. it becomes yeah. a whole lot of messy <laughs> well in some ways as well uh, you know I think the um the IFS type of things it's so similar as well um to your drama therapy because you know obviously the parts that you're playing are all just different parts of you Mm. so you know it's it's so similar really or you know the mask to me is very like uh the manager in the internal family system so you know the all the all parts of us or you know for instance I think with anxiety a massive thing is realizing you know you're not an anxious person you've got anxiety and that's your anxious part so it's then like dealing with that in you know in a completely different way really Mm -hmm. um a lot of the drama therapy as well is based on your embodiment so you know a lot of our trauma is stored in our bodies um so then it's working on like our brain and body connection through it really Oh, that's that, that's amazing because it is true. Your anxiety is not like doesn't matter what anybody says that oh you're 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 stuck with it forever. You're not like your anxiety is just a part that's trying to say there's something you need to look at. There is something there for it to be looked at. I, I think a lot of the time it could it can be that um oh, 
Oh, your camera's gone. <laughs> yeah, I just see. That. Yeah, go. Has came back. Uh, yeah, I think it can be some. You know, a lot of anxiety is related to trauma. Mm-hmm. Um, so it can be that you know, um, that it will. It's it's never that there's going to be like a quick fix for anxiety, but it's also realizing that it's in the amygdala part of your brain. So it's this that's going off all the time. So actually you know anxiety is something that w- is within us and it's that thing of what the reason why it's there is because if a bus is coming down the road you actually need that mm-hmm. um part of you that tells you to run like you know get out of the road like it's almost like going back to you know your caveman era of you know if the lion's coming then run yeah but if you've had trauma so you need the anxiety really mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, but if you've had trauma, the problem is that the anxiety is there with no actual lion. The lion's not there, but you've got the anxious response as if it is there. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so it's then dealing with, you know, what early childhood memories, or it's not necessarily from childhood, it could be, you know, a health related anxiety mm-hmm. that's then bringing up this amygdala is going like this in your mm-hmm. brain. Um, you know, and so it's working on that of um, where has that actually came from? Because actually, we're in fight or flight when we don't need to be in fight or flight all the time. Mm, or even fawn which I've recently been finding out about fawn yeah. and trauma response right that's a that's a that's crazy but you know there's there's also it's like when you have anxiety don't get attached to the labels that you anxiety is a bad thing because in our system it's been taught that you know I've suffered from anxiety for years and years and years like everybody knows my story but like what I was like told is like you just have to cope with it you just have to cope with it you have to cope with it but like you said what why is why are you getting triggered why is that anxiety on the on the high what is what is it what's going on right you're not in that survival place anymore I mean if in some cases it is you know you might be in an abusive relationship you might be in an abusive uh, household or anything like that then yeah justify that is danger survival right but there is obviously what when there's nothing there what's what is it what is what what is the trauma that yeah. that you're not looking at right really, um, and why are you getting triggered all the time really um you know um so it's looking at all them and you know anxiety is so big because you've got so many different types of anxiety um so it's just all looking back to them earlier experiences of why your why your body because a lot of the time you know where if you have anxiety you're then saying your worst case scenario consistently in your head you you're acting as if it's the worst case scenario but your body then reacts as if that's happened Mm -hmm. so that's where your reaction will come from um so it's you know realizing um to work on them ways and work with them techniques um to question that really of you know the likelihood of it happening um and consistently like questioning it yeah no that's that's yeah I'm amazing information right here but because I don't think I've talked to anybody to this extent about anxiety so this is great that you're talking it wasn't about even it. part of the yeah uh... well it, it was part of my question as well like yeah, the next is leading on to the next question <laughs> so if if somebody if some of our listeners are struggling with anxiety which you know in in this day and age post um covid times what tips can you give them so I think a big thing is you know first of all obviously is to go to therapy and personally I think a psychotherapy um, because I think it's all going to relate back to some earlier memories um, so I think that's the biggest thing um, however I do think this you know CBT um, like cognitive behavioral therapy is dealing with like your prefrontal frontal cortex um, which is techniques that you can do yourself for it and uh, so they would be you know more of the first of all it's distance in it so you know seeing this you see an anxiety is like um 
a part of you. So, you know, distancing it, you can even like label the anxiety so you can name it um, and then almost speak to it as well. So it can be that thing of, you know, if you're anxious about, um, you know, something happening, um, it can be like, okay, like what's the likelihood of this happening? Um, and then be like, okay, the likelihood's quite low. Has it ever happened before? And usually the likelihood again is, you know, on your zero level, uh, the likelihood of it happening zero to 10. And again, that's usually on your levels of, you know, one to two. And then it's realizing that actually it's just that our brains are telling us this so it's distancing and then using them questioning really um another thing is to do a 20 minutes worrying a day so to just write everything down um and if you give your brain just 20 minutes a day um that will then it's it's almost like okay this is my worry time and then after that it needs to be like okay this is a fixed time to worry mm. and then that should slow it down as well oh amazing and also we can do some breath work and we can do some meditation if, if you're able to go. Yeah. yeah and I think they're like the very known techniques but I think the biggest thing for me <laughs> but obviously this is it as a therapist is you know your breath work and your meditation are obviously really good for it in the moment and exactly the same with them CBT techniques um however I think the biggest thing is that if you're not going of the wise and you're not coming back to your you know your earlier memories you're going to be doing breath work forever I'm trying to calm this down calm this down okay I'm yeah. calm now the next day whoosh oh exactly. yeah yeah I rather than think. you know if you're say for instance uh coming on to the attachment if you're in an anxious attachment <laughs> actually it might be that you're really worried about rejection so it's working out on why yeah. have you got these anxieties do you know what I mean yeah. in relation yeah. to yeah this new person and you know otherwise the pattern's going to repeat with the next person the next person so that's why I'm not against your meditations and your breath work and your CBT again like I think they're all amazing strategies to cope with Mm. Um, but I think the biggest thing is looking at why we're doing what we're doing and why um you know why we're maybe like in these patterns of people in our lives um you know why we're you know maybe going into situations that you're then um you know almost recreating these um patterns as well really oh yeah a hundred percent agree I think like mm-hmm. one of the um this is one part of the therapy but I I I love internal family system. I go regularly yeah. all the time. Um, even throughout my journey, I've, I've worked on my trauma quite a lot, right? But still, I still go in because there's certain things. Why I had, like, I recently had a, a lot of anxiety going traveling, right? And it's like, why is that coming up? Why every yeah. time throughout my life, every time I'm traveling uh, or about to travel, worst case scenario ended up in hospital because it was that bad like that anxious I was that anxious what's going on and I went in finally was like you know what I want to solo travel but this anxiety is holding me back I'm great I'm a motivational speaker I'm doing all of this jazz I'm fearless on stage when it comes to traveling what is going on there so when it turned the family system um, but what happened was it was quite deep and obviously oftentimes goes to your childhood um yeah. our earliest memory that came up was when I was seven when I moved to the UK and uh, I remember being sick in in the um at the airport and feeling really anxious on the plane being sick on the plane and I remember this guy who was sitting with me and my mom he moved away right because he yeah. felt uncomfortable watching a child being sick all the time and that kind of thing right and that was that's when I just that's where when my earliest memory came in where the travel was because whenever I 
I'm about to travel, I feel sick. And then I get anxious about the fact that I'm going to be sick in front of people. And that seven year old experienced that when I like with that, with that guy. And then I'm obviously in the, where at the airport and that's the earliest memory. And then we worked through it. Obviously we were processing it. I've been seeing, witnessing those parts of me that that seven year old me, um, mm. what, what, you know, she had been through, um, and literally like two weeks later I ended up just like oh, yeah I'm going to Scotland I'm going Wales I'm going I'm solo traveling and with minimum anxiety it's 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 amazing that deep work you got to do that deep work like you said meditations yeah. and everything help helps on the on a on a surface and on a deeper level as well because if you get in a meditative state because ifs therapy is they take you in the meditative state first yeah. before going into your stuff right yeah so, yeah it's great it's a- yeah definitely and i think you know that is it i think i'm um, going on to you know the the airplane experience as well i think that's where you know a lot of health anxiety is quite similar to that as well so you know you're looking back at you know these earliest um things that have happened um and then it's realizing where all of this um trauma has came from really um and then why you've got everything inside of you you know it goes back to like that lion doesn't it you know you think the lion's coming where actually it's from them early experiences yeah it's crazy isn't it it's like you wouldn't even know you wouldn't even know that seven-year-old me wouldn't even know subconsciously it's been sitting in my my mind that I can't be sick around people and then I I'm trying to stop myself in my adult life trying to stop myself feeling sick feeling anxious because mm-hmm. fear of people and also fear and then obviously I've seen other memories were coming up of my mom being like my mom's been ill all the time so my mom's been ill and so seeing that as well, so just working through that, it's it's crazy. You don't even know where the trauma is. You know, if people are walking around thinking, well, I've got no big T, I'm no big trauma, but we do. But then in that, I think a problem is as well, is, you know, when you do get them people who are, you know, showing like that mask mindset or showing like their manager mindset, um, it, it's then that they will then, you know, because they're unwilling to um realize what everything's going on. So then they're you know, Anxiety them projecting it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So that manager's really protecting and not looking at the exiles because the manager's doing this job. And you know, it's it's supposed to, like, because it's trying to it's 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 helping you run the system, but you know, you kind of just have to break that down that wall of the managers and the firefighters to say okay well it's okay for you to process the trauma it's okay it's okay to feel that little bit of pain you know yeah but it's you have to go into that therapy to really recognize it you know um otherwise you can't do it on your own you'll keep repeating the same patterns and you definitely and I think the irony is that you know when people are in these uh, manager or mask like um states that's when the anxiety will come up way stronger mm-hmm. as well oh because you're masking so much yes. so it's almost like all doing this really in it you're trying so hard not to pop you know like that yes. fizzy bottle you get <laughs> yeah. a fizzy bottle right and it's like at a certain point you can shake it and if the if the cap is a little bit loose and you're trying to push the cap actually the cap is really loose and you're trying to push it down what's gonna happen is you're gonna get tired of it it's gonna <laughs> definitely yeah or yeah. well, I always use it as like a metaphor of your coke with your mentos yeah so it's you know all these mentos of uh feelings and then you know and the final one is like your anger explosion or your anxiety because you've kept that lid on so much oh yeah yeah, yeah. 100 percent oh I love this I love this interview I love I'm loving <laughs> this um Okay, so we briefly touched upon anxious attachment. You touched upon anxious attachment. That was my next question because <laughs> we do love talking about relationships. <laughs> Let's talk about relationships. Let's start with that, uh, attachment style. So go on, tell me, <laughs> tell me, enlighten us. 
<laughs> yeah um yeah so um yeah and like this is like the topic I'm like really into because I think what happens is anything you know that's happened in childhood whether that is from caregivers and then you know obviously it goes on to school and then it all out of place you know in our relationships and that could be you know relationships with co-workers it can be relationships of all, um, you know, of the romantic relationships, friendships. Um, but I think a lot of the time, um, your romantic relationships are maybe the things that can struggle the most, really. Mm. Um, or it's where things, you know, really um can come out. Um, really of depending on what's happened in them um earlier childhood experiences. Um, you know, it might be that somebody can be very uh contained in work, they can be very contained in friendships, um, but then in the romantic relationships, that's when like everything just you know uh, comes yeah. out or you know obviously um there's going to be elements that are coming out in them friendships and in work um but you know it's all working out like why that is or you know for instance sometimes it can be that thing of in work you might be experiencing like really abrupt endings but mm-hmm. actually that's because that's what you've experienced so then you like recreate that um so yes so for your anxious um attachment I just find it fascinating (laughs) yeah yeah. I mean it's like it's 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 interesting because like you know obviously from the day that you're born until the age of seven is when you really firmly um now that it can change later on depending on which type of relationships you're in but like with your caregivers it ultimately goes back to your caregivers so there's like you know we talk about four types of attachment the secure the avoidant the anxious and fearful avoidant um what I found really interesting the other day was uh when I went to this uh, attachment style um event she said um fearful avoidance majority of them most of them about 99 percent, 90 yeah 95 99 percent of them have gone through sexual abuse or abuse in their childhood mm. fearful avoidance so there it's a very it's a strong because it's hard enough being an anxious it's hard enough being an insecure avoidant insecure anxious Fearful, avoidant, mix, anxious, and avoidant in same. That is that. That is a lot. That is, yeah. You're getting dragged everywhere with emotions, the triggers, and managers, and firefighters, and protects everything. Yeah, um, and and I think that is you know going back to that like them zero to seven years you know, your brain is getting so formed from them um, early years attachments. So it's like zero to five is your most prevalent years in your life. Um, You know, so it's working on, so sometimes it might be, that's where the drama therapy can work as well of this thing of when you're in the zero to five, what should happen from your caregiver is that you are in like this attachment cycle so you know the baby screams and then they get attuned to and this caregiver goes to the baby who screams which then reassures them uh, so it's all based on you know this attachment cycle and then it goes back around basically um so then what's then happening is if the baby screams and they're not actually getting the attention that they're needing of these basic needs that's where you know your anxiety can come from or um and it's when that's not being built where all your attachment has gone basically yeah and then and then in your adult life you're attracting the opposite which is (laughs) not the case if you're anxious you're a uh, you're a magnet for uh, avoiding (laughs) avoid yeah Yeah. yeah, it, yeah yeah and that's you know that's the because you are repeating them 
patterns of what you're shown as well. Um, so then the anxious or is usually attracted to the avoidant. The avoidant is you usually never attracted to a secure person. Really? Oh, that's interesting. It doesn't really. Usually it's quite a rare one because the avoidant is actually more attracted to the anxious because they're doing this all the time. And the anxious will, you know, an anxiously attached person will almost play games to keep the avoidant interested. So they'll do this push and pull thing, um, you know, sometimes unconsciously as well. Mm. Uh, they'll do yeah so then this keeps the avoidant um you know almost like it's doing this as well really yeah. um but if you've got a very secure person uh you know who's who's been built very secure unconditional love um then the avoidant will usually get quite um it, it's just gonna get quite bored in that really yeah, like the avoidance are mostly um they have a deep core wound of rejection and anxious have deep core wound of abandonment. And yeah. obviously often goes back to your caregivers, the inconsistency of the care caregivers. And with with a with an avoidant they they, they need a lot of space because they cannot deal with deep emotions, whereas the mm. anxious is all about deep emotions but not of self other the avoidant yeah. is of self but not the other so it's that like plus and minus on the you know the batteries <laughs> yeah, yeah 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 and it's yeah. like it, and and it's it can be very stressful and can turn into a very toxic relationship because it, you often end up in trauma bonded bonded with each other which is like like we were talking about familiar hell right yeah. so me and you were we two were talking about familiar hell because I want to it's like it's really weird and it's like internally that like I want to be in a toxic relationship because it gives me that thrill that thrill that chaos that dopamine hit and and all of that pleasure hits whereas mm. in the secure relationship it's healthy it's secure it's stable and some people can brand it as boring yeah that's where a lot of the time you are you know if if you have the anxious attachment or avoidance as well it's like you're you will then go for these like dopamine hits and it's almost it's like lust in our brain is so much stronger than love where actually love if we look at love it would be very consistent it would be there for you you know but if you've not had that from caregivers your dopamine hits of somebody not being there and you know this rejection going around or these abandonment uh, wounds if somebody's doing that to you you know in the romantic relationship that's then going to give you these dopamine hits um which is where your trauma bond is just you know that's the excitement really so it's then realizing you know it's it's almost like you've got to if you are in any of them attachment styles it's realizing that actually this is lust it's not love and it's coming back to you know redefining what love is that's why you know setting boundaries is just your biggest thing of actually coming back to what is it that you want for your life mm. um and you know redefining you know what a healthy relationship actually is mm. um so it's constantly working on that really I think it's like it's uh, again we were talking about the deep work you got to look at the root of it right so you can't mm. just do the meditation on the surface it's like yeah. you can't just like okay yeah I'm an anxious attach I'm an avoid it well what I've heard in Mel Mel Robbins podcast you got the experts in and what I heard which said like avoidance will never look at that stuff because they 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 think that they're, they're in denial right mm. but the anxious would most likely will be doing the work because they want to improve 
right? And but then this is where the interesting bit. I know I'm not saying all avoidance because some avoidance are doing the work, but it's it. This is where it's interesting. What we talked about the meditation and the um on the surface level, mm. you really need to go deep into your trauma. You really need to see why about like avoidance or why have I got these walls up? Why can't I, what, what was happening there? What, what do I need to heal in my childhood and the anxious as well? Why do I feel this ab- abandonment wound and this issue and looking like while I was like, you know, obviously I was in the, in relationships and I probably got a PhD in avoidant, like, cause like I was an anxious attached and yeah, you know, working on it and it was, it was really amazing because you can't. We were talking about the relationships where two of you get together and you work through your issues together. Whether it's an avoidant and anxious, you know, they say that it doesn't work, but it does. It does if both of you are looking at it. Yeah. What I was doing in my relationship was I was going off. Okay, every time I'm feeling, I know it's wound of abandonment, it's getting triggered, and I'm feeling anxious, and I'm feeling, and I'm going to my my partner at the time is like, this is what I'm feeling, and I, that was met with criticism, but that's that's mm-hmm. completely different because you know obviously it's a different dynamic, right? And I was going, okay, well I'm gonna go and look at what is going on. So I'm booking in IFS sessions and then looking yeah. up these memories. Okay, so. What is that? Oh, wound of, of I'm feeling really anxious about this situation. I'm feeling this and I feel like, you know, um, abandonment is coming up. Okay. And then was the memories going in, memories going in. And yeah, and it's often led to points of my childhood and processing it, seeing that five year old me, six year old me, 11, 12, 13, mm-hmm. 13, when I was believing that my dad, when my dad passed away, believing my dad left me, three year old me, my dad uh, left to the UK, like left to um, left me and my mom um, to work in the UK. And that is like acknowledging that part and witnessing it, hearing it, you know, um, and that's that's the work. That's the work that we're talking about. One thousand percent. And I think, you know, as you were saying then, if both people I think a big problem in relationships is if it's only one person that's willing to work on that. And, you know, you're doing all this deep diving and you're trying to make the best for you and your relationship or definitely with, you know, families of what you're going to pass on to your children. Do you know what I mean? It's so big of how this relationship is actually going to then affect your children. Mm -hmm. But what you can get is there's just one person who's willing to work on that. Um, and then you're pushing against a brick wall like it's not gonna like that's that's where your problems can come in really yeah Um, and I think going back to your meditation and your I'm not saying all meditation and equally you know I think the internal family systems meditation is completely different Mm -hmm. to um that's going to your subconscious level which I know there's a lot of meditation that does that but you know if you're just doing like your breath work meditation um it's this thing of it's quite similar on the relationships of how people are in like these surface level relationships you know of your internet dating where um it's based on looks it might be based on finance and then equally then relationships nobody's diving deeper to know anything you know the discussions are going to be very surface level again um there's no deeper diving um but I think it's then you know realizing that actually you you need somebody who's going to if they are avoidant and you're anxious if they're then willing to do the work Mm. that's when things can then you know uh yeah yeah between the both of you something can become you know really meaningful from that but yeah. if they're not willing to do the work, that's when the problem comes of you're just doing the work. Yeah, yeah. So and you're, you're just doing you this. can't carry yeah. it. You can, you can't carry yeah. two wounds, and that's what I yeah. found in 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 my dating scene that you can't like you know when you're anxious like when you're consciously anxious like consciously working on your wounds, um, it doesn't work. It really doesn't work. And so I was gonna talk to you about red flags. 
right? What yeah. are the red flags in a relationship? <laughs> like, yeah, I mean, I always think everybody has, you know, different red flags as well. You know, so what could be a red flag to me is something completely different to somebody else. Um, but I think obviously, like, you have, I yeah, I like, I think there's like the obvious ones aren't there really um of I think communication is massive and uh, probably your biggest one you know if somebody is being inconsistent um I think that is one of your biggest red flags really is inconsistency if somebody's not you know not saying oh it could be that they're not consistent, but then they would say, oh, sorry, I've not um, got back to you or something like that, you know, within a, a certain amount of time, really. Um, but if you're, I think, massively, yeah, inconsistency of communication, um, but also it's realising, I think with red flags, it's talked about so much, but a lot of the time it's not talked about why you're, mm-hmm you know why you you're addicted to that red flag yeah yeah (laughs) so you know like yeah why that person is actually really liking that inconsistency Mm. so you know it's that thing of being like you could have a really consistent person there and actually you would find you'd just be like oh no I've got the ick (laughs) yeah yes because they're so consistent yeah they're so there oh mate yeah so but actually so I think there's so much talk around red flags but not about like and again it's going back to you know then uh that childhood experiences of why you know it's like red flags that then feel like home Mm. so you're so addicted to them because they feel like home um so a lot of the time, I think we all do know the red flag. <laughs> we brush it aside because we're in a lusty period, because aren't we? It's like, yeah. I'm getting a dopamine hit here. Right? Yeah. 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 <laughs> I'm going to brush this aside. <laughs> yeah. And then exactly. a year or two down the line, it's like, that was the yeah. worst mistake ever. <laughs> really? And I think a lot of the time as well. I don't know if I'm just going off like personal experience here, but I always think if I looked back at my like relationships, I would always be able to tell very soon off. Mm. So, you know, I'm talking about like one, two, three months in, I could almost predict that relationship. Yeah. Um, where actually, you know, if if you've spent three months of your life with that person, that and you've managed to be like okay like I I identify this and then you can you know remove yourself but I think a lot of the time the patterns that are in these earlier stages in them three months are repeating five years down the line it's Mm. the same pattern Mm. so you can detect quite I think you can detect quite easily really so I think you're I think the biggest thing is your selection process. Yeah, selection process. Yeah, really yeah. It's yeah like how why? much? Pro- oh, yeah. yeah. It's yeah. like a, a health. You know what the the conscious way of dating nowadays is like. So, how much trauma have you looked into? What's your childhood like? <laughs> Rather than it's like, what do you do for work and what is all of that? So what's going on? What's your trauma? What was your parents like with you? And what was this? And what was your heart- first heartbreak like? What was your previous? <laughs> yeah. And then what are you doing to work on it as well? Yeah, exactly. Like exactly. Question, isn't it? Yeah. Like, yeah. Yeah, I've heard like um, there was a lady on Instagram. She's like, she comes out with really amazing stuff. She goes like, when you you're doing healing work on yourself, you see red flags in everybody because <laughs> and then you do you see I was like yeah well yeah and you not even that and then you realize she goes like then you realize that everybody wants not everybody she was like many people want a superficial um connection which is on the mm-hmm. surface level but because you've done your you doing the work on you you want a deeper intimacy a safe connection which isn't just surface level it's deeper and deeper 
you know it's like you know you have four stages to a relationship where stage one the honeymoon the stage two is where all the egos and all the stuff comes in and and then if you can work through that then you you end up being like you know in a in a much healthier place in your relationship but why do you think after the honeymoon from uh honeymoon period lasts, lasts from a year or two like six months to 24 months uh period and then people i seen so many people in my in my life break up after two years three years because they just don't know how to deal with that 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 trauma the stuff that comes up for them they don't know how to deal with it and they they, nobody's taught them and nobody taught like we we weren't taught relationships in schools we weren't right it's it's because as well I think it's that thing a lot of people are mirroring what their caregivers Mm. so a lot of it's just mirroring what whatever that was real yeah um and but as you say, I think that's I think that's kind of where you know you're. It's not that I'm against internet dating, but I think it's definitely based on a um, superficial, like surface level. Mm. Um, you know, unless you're really looking into their profiles and um, things like that, I think it can be based on your surface level. Mm. Um, and there's an element of. Um, um more options out there so yeah. it's easier to end a relationship it's easier to go someone because you know there's there's so many different yeah. options out there but that's an illusion so we have like um we follow like this there's um psycho who is it like sadia like on on yeah. instagram and she talks about it and i think she's 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 been gone you know it's an illusion of yeah. options um, yeah that I think feel... it goes back yeah definitely, like 100 percent. it's that thing of um I always think it's like I think his name I can't remember there's a doctor now his book is amazing but he says that you go into the supermarket and um and you know years ago because he's he's not actually talking about relationships but I think his metaphor <laughs> really applies but you know uh years ago you just have your orange juice and you'd have your black orange juice and you choose one or the other and then you'd be happy with that um because you haven't been given like you know the orange juice without the pulp then the orange juice with the pulp then you've got the pineapple you've got so many options so when you leave with like the orange juice you think oh maybe I would have been happier with the pineapple yeah and (laughs) you know and the same with you know going back years ago you know you go to blockbusters and you get a film and then you'd be made up with your film because you've went and you've chosen it but now we've got so many options on Netflix that you're watching something and you're thinking oh maybe I would have been yeah and I think it's the same with the internet dating I think it's making you think that you have so many options but in that, nobody's building anything. Yeah, exactly. So, hopefully. Yeah. And then how, yeah. okay, so you have options. You go from one person to the other person. Then then what happens is when you actually meet that person, you can easily get rid of them because you're, you're not looking at your trash, your trauma. Yeah. So, <laughs> how, yeah. <laughs> where's, yeah. where's the success in that? Um, but yeah no I think I feel like there is as as like internet stuff's coming in and more options is like relationships are easily uh disposable like you know there yeah and it's 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 sad it really is sad because I don't like that word I don't like when people say don't put your eggs in one basket Mm. it's like okay so if I have yeah but what what about what about like you put it in one basket because you want to grow it you want to build it you want to nurture it right Mm -hmm. you put that egg you put it in you're looking after it your focus is there you're loving it it's loving you back and all of that stuff and you're looking at you know and then the eggs okay it turns into a beautiful I don't know like a a chicken (laughs) right and (laughs) right and then yeah you know, you'd be proud. It's like, we built that. I nurtured that. We nurtured that, right? Yeah. 
and you have that connection, you have that bond. But with so many other options, you're going to neglect yourself and others as well. Definitely. Yeah. And I, I think, but do you think it comes back to if something's based on a surface level? Yeah. So, you know, if something's based on a surface level, I think then, you know, it's, everything's replaceable isn't it do you know what I mean so what like you're always gonna have a girl who comes along who would be perceived as you know the new diamond the new whatever like you're very replaceable um but I think it's you know if something's built and you know built very slowly as well um yeah and I think you know it's building them deep meaningful connections mm. um which then you know is not replaceable mm. um which I think that's where that's where things are going wrong a little bit really yeah. is people can't build and the deeper connections so everybody's becoming quite replaceable in it really yeah and also like you just made me think of a uh, um you know, we're, we're also very desperate to find something externally, you know, somebody to save us. But we were talking about Na- Najwa Zobian, if I got her name yes. right. Um, we've been reading her book, Welcome Home. And that book is amazing. I haven't finished it yet. I'm still like slowly reading through it out of my busy schedule. But the, that book is amazing because it just shows um, – the, the home is all first first and foremost is built within yourself yeah right and you know in the book she talks about the how she was um how she was looking for she was attracting people that she, she needed to save so it wasn't yeah. the attraction to them it was the attraction to their pain and yeah. that was oh my god that was like oh my god no yeah it hit me it hit me as well because it was like that's what I feel like I've been doing and then now I know where the work is but yeah she's she's incredible you know her books it's, are incredible. yeah it's yeah. just I think that is massive really it is that thing of being you know attracted to their pain rather than uh, building that home within which the book is so amazing because it's got these things of how you build yeah. that home with them but I think it all comes back to you know them feelings of being good enough as well um you know and that um good enough for connection and uh, being vulnerable enough being seen as your true self um and the willingness really um to be seen as your true self to build them connections mm. but also I think we're in a society which is also having this thing of not only are people working from not a place of good enough, which is, I think that's ongoing work for most people, um, but also like in a truce of partner, that partner, they're not being good enough. So they're wanting this success, they're wanting this, um, you know, financial or looks wise or these surface level things again, rather than working on a place of both being good enough. Yeah, true. That is true. And also just work, we're even working along with your like attachment styles. So if you get yeah. in a relationship, both of you are aware doing the work and both of you like, okay, your, your attachment style is anxious. Mine is avoidant. How can we meet each other halfway? And how can we go off work outside of the relationship? And then when we come yeah. in, in the relationship, how can we work through our issues and stuff right that is that is really important to have a have a partner who is on base with with the work that you're doing on yourself and also it's like coming in or love languages right like no not many people talk about love languages yeah love languages bringing that in it's like okay what is your love language it's like I and you know um affirmations and you have gifts you have um physical, physical touch, touch. yeah and you have quality time what was the fifth one act of service yeah. yeah yeah and like knowing that not just for like oh educational purposes yeah knowing that like I want to improve that in me and also in in my partner so it's like okay so what is your like mine's physical touch then I'll make the effort to do that 
and what's yours mine's I uh, uh, quality time I make the effort mm. to put my phone away to spend that quality time with you right? I think it's also coming back to as well of thinking you know especially with you know physical touch as well I think it's that thing of if somebody's not naturally like that uh, and I don't think that is a natural thing again it's coming back to the why Yes. so then realizing that actually from their caregivers they didn't receive love in that way so that's way too much they see it as way too big a thing of a physical touch so it's then realizing that actually even though you know my way to receive love might be that then their way is because of something that's happened so it's them working on this together yeah um and slowly and that's yeah, yeah. slowly yeah. you come together okay okay so if okay I recognize that I'm not very good at physical touches um obviously I'm already doing the work outside the relationship I'll take this work and see like what's trauma going on with this is a thing when you're in a relationship you don't want to be offloading all your trauma to your partner right you want to be going away from your partner doing your own individual work that's really important and then coming together like okay well this came up in the in I'm um, a family system or whatever therapy that this is the reason why I'm being vulnerable vulnerability in relationships key right alongside communication that this was why this is why I'm I'm like this and if your other if your partner is understanding you work through it it's like okay well we'll take it as one step at a time how do you want to what do you want me to do it's like okay well let's try just holding hands and cuddling each other for 10 minutes so that's okay yeah okay right and then you just work you work you work as a team you work as a team not as in you're the enemy you work as a team yeah and I think I think a key is definitely like you were saying is that vulnerability um you know I'm willing to be vulnerable um and I think that's I think that's massive and it really is um is you know willing you know I think it's that thing of being willing to you know say I love you first to you know um working on them places really um and I think that's massive and I think sometimes that's the thing where now what we are doing is where um, you know I'm going off the uh Brenny Brown uh the power of vulnerability yeah Yeah. and you know she's always saying you know how we numb vulnerability so what we're doing is you know you go she says like you go and you get like uh yeah you know you get food or you get alcohol to like numb this pain like I don't want to feel this anymore and then you know that's where then you know your Botox comes in all of these things because we're in a society that's wanting to perfect everything yes. rather than actually uh, working on why are you not feeling good enough just as you are do you know so it's working on that vulnerable side really yeah I completely yeah. agree I, I love Brene Brown like yeah you know, she's just she's just yeah she's incredible and I oh think one God. of the biggest things as well, I think when we are in this culture, I also think like, what are we then passing down to like our next generation? Do you know what I mean? Like, yeah. what are we then saying? If if when, you know, if we're living in this Botox perfected world, mm. um, you know, what are we then passing down to these little girls who are, you know, then go into this weird type of perfectionism um so and I think a lot of people personally I don't think a lot of people are thinking about the next generation and how you know how you're working on yourself for that next generation as well yeah and and what you're gonna pass down really um because if you're you know not in them states of good enough being you know um a parent or a teacher or whatever um then that will transfer so it's from you work and from your place of being good enough as you are and that is consistent work it's like sometimes I think it's telling like a um you know a messy person to be clean (laughs) (laughs) do you know what I mean so it's like every day I'm thinking oh my gosh like (laughs) 
Um, so I do think it's continuous work, but I think it's in questioning the, you know, why you're doing this. Mm. I think that's massive, really. Yeah, I think it, we, we're kind of just going down in it. Like uh, this topic is like another podcast itself, like bringing like generational stuff. So like, you know, from generation to generation to generation, this is how we've been in terms of relation. Actually, in like all... um a previous generation lasted a lot longer in relationships whether it was toxic or not like whether you stay in because of sake of staying is debatable but they worked at it right and yeah and what we are doing is we're not we're it's like i said we're, we're everybody is like oh disposable next person next person next person yeah and then the kids will follow on to that or either they will have to heal your your stuff yeah right so it's really important to know to know that yeah. you know it's to why it's generational you're... trauma really and who's yeah. gonna break that pattern yeah. so if you're carrying around that generational trauma from your caregivers or whoever that might be um you know if you're not willing to break that pattern and work on yourself, you are going to pass that on. Yeah. Um, so I think it's being really willing to break that generational trauma, really. Yeah, I had I was listening to a, a talk. Um, I, I'll briefly talk about it. But this woman was uh, saying that the things that you don't heal, your children will have to heal. So if you're an, if you got issues with lust and all of that stuff right your children will have the battle to heal that and it's like do you want that you know like so many like the divorces are high there's many kids with um I mean you work with kids yourself right as a as a therapist so the, the divorces are high and kids are going through broken uh, not broken homes but separated homes mm. and now they have to heal that wound of abandonment their their fear of rejection and and that will play out in their relationships right because they caregivers again caregivers yeah definitely and it is all all coming back to that really yeah. um you know but it is it is in breaking them cycles yeah. really yeah. Uh, and the willingness to work continuously you know and I do really think it is like the metaphor of being like this messy you know this messy person and trying to be tidy you know it's continuous work I think only a messy person will understand that metaphor but yeah. Like, yeah. Uh, you know and it's realizing that you know and also thinking like okay like I am going to like mess up in whatever form that is you know if that's talking about relationships or that's talking about being you know um a parent but the willingness to say I've messed up but and this is why and I think that's probably massive in it really yeah yeah completely agree completely agree Whoosh. oh wow <laughs> This yeah, interview is amazing. Exactly. This interview is incredible. I mean, like, I think we'll probably we'll just get we'll get you on again next time and we'll talk oh, about no. deep depth of like more more stuff and because relationship subject is very, very hot at the moment. <laughs> so oh yeah. It's, it's yeah. Um so yeah, oh my god, I don't know what to say because it's just mind blowing, mind blowing. All everything that you've you've talked about in this podcast has been so insightful. And for me to like also like when I when I was telling you about my experiences, I've had light bulb moments while I was telling you in this podcast. So it's like I'm gonna go away and journal, see what's what's going on there. Um before we wrap this up, I want to ask you a rapid fire questions, which I ask all of the guests. <laughs> so be prepared to be grilled. <laughs> yeah. All right. Are you ready? <laughs> I've just done it avoid and I'm gone. <laughs> all right. Okay. So um, what is your definition of universe life God? Um, yeah, so I think, I mean, it's a massive, um, it's a massive question. And for me, I'm, you know, I'm very spiritual. Uh, but I think what we're 
you know what we've came to in society now is people are saying like I'm right and you're wrong and there's you know and science is the answer rather than being like you know coming to a place where everybody's just questioning um and I think that's massive in it um but I think for me my faith is massive so you know um and a very um strong um you know I believe in God very um firmly so I get directed by him and I wouldn't say that comes down to a religion that's just a faith spirituality yeah Yeah, spirituality rather than religion amazing what do you think happens when you die yeah so my belief is um that we go to heaven um or like the the afterlife really um and you know I definitely believe that um you know every every person who's passed you will then like go to meet them again um and but also that they are your guardian angels beautiful how do you define religion and spirituality um, so my definition is just really believing that there's something higher than us. Um, so I think it's just having that higher, you know, whether you want to call that universe or God, but it's believing that there is this higher uh, being and, you know, and also believing that we're all here for connection. Like that's our root reason of being here Mm -hmm. um you know and maybe you do have a message to the world or maybe you are there to be connected to your um children do you know what I mean so I think like we all have different um different like life paths Mm -hmm. yeah um and it's sticking to your like soul's life path but the only way that you can do that is by having that like inner dialogue with the universal god yeah, beautiful. Uh, what's the lesson that took you the longest to learn? Oh, that is a really uh, <laughs> good yeah. question because I've just had so many lessons. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> it's probably ongoing as uh, well. <laughs> I definitely say I definitely say that I lived in a masked world for a very long time so, so um, yeah <laughs> yeah I definitely had surface level connections uh for yeah a very long period of life um so yeah I'd say and also I probably you know I've probably had really secure uh relationships as well which I've not realized that they've actually been good enough uh so yeah okay do you believe that people with horrible beginnings end up creating the best features um I think it can really vary Mm -hmm. my my biggest belief is that um a person definitely needs some sort of um love around them um you know so I think I think a massive thing is that you know we I think as like a system we can create you know if somebody's had absolutely no love around them um then it's almost like that's a making of something which is if somebody's had no love um but I do think if somebody's had a lot of challenges in their life um and then they've met people along the way who've shown them um love and I think we can all be a part of that process for people and mm-hmm. um, then I do think it can it can build such a resilience yeah and yeah. somebody uh, that they then have this resilience which from their earlier experiences which maybe somebody if they've not had them experiences hasn't got as much resilience Oh, beautiful. Yeah. Beautiful. Um, I am fully in present moment when? I was, what was it? I'm fully in present moment when? Oh, like, if I'm really honest, it would be through hot yoga. Oh, that's <laughs> nice. <laughs> Great. Love it. Love it. Yeah. Um, do you believe there is an end to healing? No. 
definitely yeah. not. Yeah. I think it's a yeah. I think we're all souls and. We've all, um, you know, I think it's just an ongoing uh, process all the time. Yeah. Which is really hard. <laughs> yeah, it is. It is. Yeah. 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 But, you know, it's it's the process. You stay stuck yeah. or you move forward. Um, the world needs more of what? Um, Probably, yeah, definitely connection and vulnerability and less ego <laughs> definitely Beautiful. love it love it if there is one message that you would share with somebody who's going through adversity uh, hard times spiritual awakening dark night of the soul um mm-hmm. and they can't see the light at the end of the tunnel what is that one message that you would give them yeah i think probably one of my favorite favorite words is hope um and I always think if you can carry that no matter how small it is it's a lot a lot of the time it's realizing that it is just like there's always going to be an end to that season Mm -hmm. you know it's just that season Uh, so a lot of the time I think it's like realizing that there is going to be this end to that season but it's also carrying um carrying hope as well definitely beautiful beautiful I love that how can people contact you? Uh, yeah, so uh, via Instagram, um, email, or any of the ways. <laughs> yeah, I'll uh, I'll link it in the description. Um, thank you, Francesca, for coming on this podcast and sharing your knowledge um, about everything. Really, we covered everything: we have relationship, the drama therapy, like wounds and like trauma and uh, like dating red for every single thing on this planet probably <laughs> so thank you so much for coming on and yeah that it was absolute um i loved interviewing you it was great oh it's, it's great. been amazing Such a laugh. To talk Such a laugh. Away as well, yeah. yeah 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 oh thank you oh. thank you for listening to this episode i would absolutely love to know what your biggest takeaway from this conversation has been you can share your thoughts on my facebook or instagram madia sosen if you would like to listen to this episode I am on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and many, many more. Just search Soul Awakenings with Madhya Sosan. If you enjoyed this episode, then please do rate and share this with your family and friends, as that will help me out a lot. Thank you so much once again, and I will see you in the next episode.